Good morning, guys. Happy Monday. I, ho I hope you had a productive uh, weekend. This is week five. We went to Texas CCSM and we're back now. It was pretty successful. Two of our students presenting their research, though. So that was pretty, pretty amazing. Actually, one of them uh, had a judge poster. So one of them um, was uh, evaluated as top level research, which makes me really, really happy. Now, uh, the purpose of this video is always again um, started with giving you feedback about the LOs you submitted and then talk about what we're covering this week and of course a reminder of what you have to submit by Sunday. Um, when I saw your LOs uh, that were due yesterday, I didn't, <coughs> sorry I'm a little bit sick, um, I didn't see any issues. Uh, with what we had um, so I don't have anything specific to tell you unless you have to if you need to ask me questions let me know um, I'm always here send me an email a message or Moodle or we can even Skype if we need to for uh, this week we're covering the second part of experimental design and we'll also talk about field research so chapters 8 and nine, which means LO8 and LO9 due this Sunday. All right, so I'll go ahead and start with because we have, as always, a good amount of information, <laughs> a good amount of information to cover. Now, uh, this is the second part, chapter eight is the second part of experimental design. And our book starts by saying that, you know, um, we can figure out the purpose of an experiment pretty quickly uh, if everything goes well but the actual details of uh, doing the experiment or doing the actual um, project may take time and we need to allocate this time especially identify the dependable uh, the dependent and independent variables of our project so in general the the <coughs> I'm sorry, the, the more control we have uh, or we're going to design it in that way that we have a lot of control, then the less we can generalize or extrapolate the findings. And we'll see how it, that's different when we're doing field research in a little bit when I talk about Chapter 9. Now, this chapter talks about, <coughs> I'm sorry, especially um, dependent variables. Um, blinding, randomization, and matching. Okay, that's what we're going to cover today. So the dependent variable is the one that's going to be measured, right? So have primary is the one that's going to be uh, directly influenced and secondary the, the ones or the, the one that will be indirectly influenced. And then we have surrogate um, dependent variables which are more practical um, or appropriate than a primary DV, but in general, um, we need to be very careful because the, the dependent variable that we're going to identify and select is going to depend on, uh, on the independent variable that we're going to select. Now, criteria, now of course validity and, <laughs> and reliability, <coughs> and um, of course something for a, a variable to be uh, valid it has to be reliable first feasibility which is the practicality and uh, subjectivity which is um, potential bias that may come with uh, the selection of a specific variable have to be taken into consideration during that process of course there is other limitation and we know that when especially we have a complex issue one dependent variable may not be enough to explain um, that phenomenon. Um, but then again, if we keep adding dependent, va dependent variables, then we are may have issues with interpretation because we have to take them all into consideration when interpreting our results. In any case, we have to choose dependent variables based on the literature view and pilot studies. So we have to think about uh, the evidence base 
selection of those uh, dependent variables. Then, uh, as our book says, we need to ask some questions. Is that dependent variable accurate, precise, reliable, va valid, able to be collected, processed, analyzed, and so on and so forth? The main idea here is for all of us to understand that this is a very, very crucial step, so we need to spend uh, the time that we need to spend. Now, blinding. Blinding, we're all, we're all, we're all ha we all have bias, more or less, about everything in life. Uh, unconscious, uh, sorry, conscious or subconscious. And a way to eliminate or at least decrease bias is blinding. For example, a lot of times when I um, grade some open-ended question allows for other courses, I try not to look at the name of the student. I'm trying to blind it myself, so I, I'm trying to be more subjective, if that makes sense. So um, we're trying to truly measure or test the efficacy of, of the interventions. So we have to take bias away as soon as possible. And you know, for example, you, you're familiar with the placebo effect, which is an example of bias. Now, we have non-blinding experiments, and sometimes it's necessary to do it that way. They're more realistic, but although they may be the only option sometimes, bias doesn't go away. Now there's another thing, the single blind, blind uh, experiment. So only the participants don't know what is going on. The researchers do. That is great, and it may depend again on the case. <coughs> um, so we need to investigate if we need to go single blind or even double blind, which is the researchers and the participants do not uh, know who is in the intervention group, for example, who is in the group, or the control group. Sometimes we have some researchers that know and some researchers that don't know, trying to find a solution in between. So we decrease bias, but we're more flexible. Okay. Now let's talk about randomization, which is this, uh, the, the last big part of this chapter. We're trying to avoid selection and accidental bias. And a great way to do that is randomization. Okay. Now the book starts saying that random selection is different than random assignment. Random selection is I, I pick the sample randomly from the whole population. Random assignment is I have the sample already. Let's say even I even have a, ca a convenient sample. I just pick the students of my class. Right, but and then I assign them to groups randomly. But in the very beginning, they weren't picked randomly. That's different. Uh, accidental bias are based on personal preferences a lot of times and are, un are unforeseen. So um, the best way to avoid those again is randomization. That's the remedy of this issue. We're trying to avoid unequal group uh, representation. So we have, there are many ways um, to um, randomize our participants or our conditions uh, in, in, in the groups or in the conditions. We have simple, which is a simple flip coin or via software. It's really simple, right? And that's a simple um, randomization. We have block randomization that is more sophisticated pattern and you see figure 8.2. And in those cases, for example, we can control the size of the different groups, that's a nice way. And then we we'll have stratified randomization, which is, for example, something I did in another class of mine that I needed to have. Uh, I would bring together two classes to do some group projects, and I want to have this many from this class, but also this many from that class. So it was stratified. I created the conditions, and in that way, I was able to um, create to create groups that are. Um, comparable okay so I'll create some conditions and then I randomly assign them into those groups now sometimes randomization is not a possibility and it's not uh, feasible based on the design of um, our project so we may have matching uh, matching will eliminate variance for sure so if I have two groups that they, ha they have to have a specific inclusion criteria so I need to have 
four key players in one group and swimmers in another group. That would be maths. I need to maths them in a way that makes sense for my research question. Um, take your time to figure out your dependent variables. Just take your time to select the ones that are best for you. Know what is blinding and know all the ways to randomize the participants. And that's all from chapter 8. So I'll go ahead and move to chapter 9, which is field research. So we're going to change gears a little bit. All right. Um, we're talking about getting outside of the lab, which is something that has a lot of benefits, but also some limitations. So we need to talk about today why we will do something <laughs> like that. <coughs> will be convenient and appropriate. So in general, we are... Um, we would like to have experiments in there is a need for real life condition and if something is um, being done in real life conditions then there's a higher probability to extrapolate right there's a higher external validity which is great which is great um, so if it's something that is related to our RQ and we can go outside and do it outside of the lab go for it however let's see a little bit what we should be thinking. Uh, let's start with research design. It's pretty much the same as we do in the lab. You just have to consider the uniqueness of the situation. We have again observational research, right? I put a GPS unit on your back and you run around as a soccer player and I'm just observing. I don't do anything else, right? I get the data. You have within subjects, which again is very, very similar to lab. I'm comparing, I, I am the baseline, I'm comparing uh, my post intervention to my pre intervention results, and then we have between subjects here we have two or more groups. Okay, but because there's so many factors, and why are there so many factors? Because we're outside of the lab, we can't control for extraneous variables. So many factors, even if we have between subject situation, even then, then maybe we cannot infer causality. So that's important. We could have a lot of variables that may not be accounted for. Um, the, the benefits, we'll talk about the benefits. Real sports setting, as our book says, competition, accurate uh, psychophysiological status. Um, we may uh, need to um, have extreme physiological demands and responses, which is possible outside in the field. And we can screen a lot of subjects at the same time and at the same place, right? But the, the main disadvantage is, is there's a lack of true experimental control. And that's the main thing because there's so many variables interacting with each other. And a lot of times there's not a possibility for a crossover design. The main is a lack of true ex <coughs> experimental control that hurts us. A lot of logistics, a lot of logistics. You need to move the equipment, right? You want to do VO2 max or any kind of measurement. How are you going to transport it? What do you need to transport it? When it has to be transported? How is the weather going to be? Can you use it outside? Is it too hot? Is it going to rain? Is it going to snow? What is going on? Uh, and then communication between your uh, personnel and your research assistants and all the researchers and all the research team. Do we need some kind of equipment to do that? Because the field may be huge. We don't want to get lost. We want to be organized and do things as we're supposed to do, right? Um, personnel, do you need more? Do you need to create stations that you have people waiting there for your participants to come and they are organized and everybody knows what they're doing? Do you need to make them more identifiable through t-shirts and hats and so on and so forth? And that's cost, shipping costs. How much would it take us to take it there? Um, do we need um, to do, we can do a lot of that research on site at once, but how are we going to, what do we need to uh, have as cost from food and water from our researchers, um, transportation, um, as we said, um, any kind of notebooks, pen, whatever we may need. So there may be additional costs that we have to figure out. Now, when you submit a proposal to the IRB, it's again, 
unique. It's unique because you're going to check the box that says the research uh, is going to take place off of campus, which makes opens the whole box of worms. You need permissions from the managers or whoever is running the show at that site that you're going to collect data, right? Uh, you need to report all these logistical issues uh, and it's not only about the safety of your crew but also we have um, what are you going to do in the case of emergency if you're outside in the field it's way more it was way safer and more control in the lab for example right? what about confidentiality how are the data going to be stored until you leave the field to bring them in an office are they going to be hard copies are they going to be in an electronic form? What is going to go? What's going to happen there? All these details must be added in the RV proposal. Statistical issues. Uh, sometimes when we have field um, projects, we have a little bit of higher attrition, so you have to take that into consideration. Other than that, you're still going to use the same software. You're still going to use the same data, and you still should be okay. For interpretation. Before we go to the effect size and so on and so forth, we need to understand that field research has helped us a lot, especially with research that has to do with injury and in a sport like football, for example, with concussion. We get really good data because of we because we do this kind of research right there at that time and at that place. Now, we talked about it. <coughs> excuse me. We talked about effect size before. We try to measure the strength of the phenomenon. So we take the inferential statistics, we take the significant findings, and then we add the effect size to see how significant, how how strong that phenomenon is. Right? There's always error there. And that's why we're trying to avoid that. Uh, but for effect size, we usually we are a lot of ways to do it. Uh, Cohen's D is the most classic one. Um, so you divide the two means and then um, you subtract the two means and divide it by the standard deviation of the two of the sample. But um, the numbers you get 0.23, that's a small effect size around 0.5, medium, 0.8, and above, really strong, large, large effect size, which is great, of course, as you understand. A couple more things before we finish this chapter reliable change index, that's another way. To interpret results, uh, it's it, it talks about clinically meaningful change, and that's a way. Yes, there's a change, but what does it mean for the practitioner? Does it make any sense? Right? Is that important? So that's one way. RCI. That's one way to interpret results. Then we talk about sensitivity. Let's talk about sensitivity and specificity. That's important. And I would like you to remember that we're talking about the true positives. And the true negatives and usually we compare the results of a test to a gold standard so we compare one test any test even a pregnancy test is is it, go, is it going to give you a true positive when it says you're not pregnant is it going to give you a true negative right that is really important for a test in but when you're not comparing to a gold standard which is kind of similar but not the same we're talking about predictive value right What's the probability of a true positive? Which means how many times if I take that test and it says I am pregnant, I am actually pregnant, and then we have the negative predictive value, which is the probability of a true negative. How many times if it says I'm not pregnant, how many times is that true? Okay, that's very important about tests and that's very important about interpreting the results. Know the uniqueness of field research, know the pros and the cons. And make sure you go over the glossary again. All right, that's all for me, guys. Uh, have a great week. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm not traveling this week, which is great. Um, and I can catch up with your emails and everything. If I miss somebody, let me know. Uh, and um, other than that, uh, I'm really satisfied with, with the way we move. Let me know if you have any questions. All right. In the meantime, live intentionally, not habitually. Bye, guys.